And before I start, I just want to say that this event is sponsored by the National Endowment for Humanities, Cross Cultural Center, CSUSD, I'm going in and out, um, an Asian study program here. So um, it is with great pleasure that we introduce Dr. Nancy Chen, who is a professor of anthropology at UC Santa Cruz. Am I going in and out? No, you're fine. Oh, I'm fine. Okay, good. I just want to, you know, let you know that she and I have the same last name. But <laughs> Chen is also the most like, common last name around the world. So if you see a Chen, you know, you've seen more common than the Smiths and the Jones here. So um, Dr. Chen is, has received a bachelor degree in human biology from Stanford University and she has a PhD from a joint program at UC San Francisco and UC Berkeley in the uh, medical anthropology. So she comes with a lot of um, experience and expertise in what she's going to talk about. And so her area of research includes foods and medicine, traditional healing practices, Chinese biotechnology, mental health and cross-cultural psychiatry, and Asian American identity. She's the author of the book called Food, Medicine, and Quest for Good Health. And also this book is available uh, uh, for sale in the outside the room for 2862, which includes the book and the text. And it's being sold by our bookstore. So um, she is the author of this book and another book called Breathing Spaces, Qigong, Psychiatry and Healing in China, which was published by Columbia Press in 03 and again second printing in 05. She co-edited several volumes of books including Asian Biotechnology, Ethics and Communities of Faith in 2010, Bodies in the Making, Transgression and Transformation in 06, and China Urban Ethnographies of, Ethnographies of Contemporary Culture and with the third printing in 06. So I really want you folks to give your attention and uh, applause to Dr. Chen, who is here from UC Santa Cruz. Good afternoon. And first of all, I want to thank Professor uh, Chen Maynard for, uh, for a wonderful introduction. Um, I also want to uh, give my thanks to Professor uh, Raymond Chuang. Uh, on behalf of CSU San Bernardino for hosting this lecture on food, medicine, and biotechnology in China. Uh, now, my talk today is based on research that I've been conducting for over a decade now. Uh, and I'll be going back between, uh, uh, between this podium and that podium because this is actually... Uh, uh, I don't have a pointer. Oh, you have a pointer. I can do it. Yeah, you can do it. Just uh, but first of all, I just want to say that uh, I've been doing research uh, for over a decade now, tracking transformations uh, in food, medicine, and bodily practices in post-socialist China. Um, and one of the things that we've been talking about is about uh, notions of citizenship and how this is really uh, uh, attenuated through the ability to consume. So. Uh, my presentation is going to be examining the realms of food and medicine and how these intersect not only in traditional systems of healing, but contemporary formations of biotechnology. And actually, as you can see from the outline, um, I'm not going to be looking at traditional medicine first. I'm going to be switching. Normally I, talk, I begin with that and then I go into the contemporary. But I thought I'd switch it around a little bit for today's lecture because I want us to think about um, certain forms of knowledge and uh, how they become uh, reconfigured in the contemporary context. Um, I should also let you know that the talk today is going to be somewhat, uh, I'll be going back and forth between slides, but then also reading certain sections. Uh, but uh, hopefully I won't be putting it to sleep because I know it's during the noon hour uh, during the lunch period and I very much appreciate uh, your coming uh, today for, uh, for this talk. Um, but I'm going to leave a considerable amount of time. My goal is to leave for at least 30 to 40 minutes of Q&A because I think it's very important for you to um, be able to ask the questions that you, you have concerning food and medicine. Um, I understand many of you are studying nutrition with Professor Chen Maynard. Uh, many of you are interested in uh, China uh, and Asian studies, and so my goal is to hopefully uh, allow the, all of you uh, with different interests to come together uh, and share your questions. So let me begin with 21st century China. 
Oh, there's a quote there. Fantastic. So, uh, as we know, China is a big story. And especially in Western media, it's not just in Chinese media, but it's a big story. And not a day goes by uh, without hearing reports about the Chinese market, uh, as well as the bureaucracy that spawned its reach into the new global economy. So, specific images might come to mind when uh, we really consider the story. Uh, I'll over here just very briefly. Oh, I wonder if it's possible to actually maybe uh, turn down the light a little bit so that on the screen so we can actually see the, uh, the slides. Uh, what I did was basically uh, combine a couple of images. Uh, of course, you know, the, the, the leftmost image is the New China Century. Uh, there's a Newsweek cover story about China Century. Um, and then down in the far right corner, uh, is actually, uh, it looks like a monument, but it's actually, and it is, uh, it's a monument to the Chinese century um, in Beijing. So it's uh, very close to Tiananmen Square. Uh, you can see it's all really old, and this is during the, the most recent Luna uh, Festival uh, that they, uh, you know, put it all in mice and such. So I just want to give you a sense of how quickly um, the story of China is. Now, uh, in addition to these images, uh, I'm going to follow with a couple of other images as well. Um, this is taken from the Beijing 2008 Olympics, where obviously um, uh, this is an important, uh, uh, very um, grand display uh, during the opening ceremonies, as we all know. And uh, really, this was really the moment where uh, the new China emerged on the world stage. Another common image that you might uh, know about is actually, or have heard about, is the Three Gorges Dam. Uh, this is a massive uh, state project uh, that uh, has been controversial. Uh, many, many people were uh, relocated, uh, as was, they basically had to give up their homes. Uh, that had villages, entire villages, uh, were basically removed. Uh, but what's important is really, uh, you know, I'm trying to show these huge, epic uh, state projects that represent uh, the new China. Uh, some of you may also know about the emerging uh, aeronautic uh, or aerospace uh, program, where uh, China has been not only launching satellites, but also launching uh, taikonauts. Um, uh, instead of calling them uh, astronauts, uh, taikonauts in Chinese, uh, these are the new state heroes. Uh, these are the people who um, are recognized as uh, taking on uh, new, new risks and uh, exploring new territory. Later on in this talk, I'm going to also talk about the less well-known biotech industry, because I think this is also another uh, important marker of 21st century China. Uh, it gives you a sense of you know, how uh, this has emerged in this century. And uh, one of the key themes I'd like to emphasize uh, throughout this talk is the fact that uh, China today is not simply new China. It's actually the embodiment of old China as well. Um, a lot of uh, ancient monuments, as well as uh, uh, histories, um, have been uh, re reconfigured and they become part of the national story of uh, origin, as well as uh, construction to shape the present. So there's a way in which uh, we have to realize that New China is not simply something that emerged out of nowhere. Uh, New China is something that is very much related to um, traditional concepts. Um, at the same time, it's important to think about its people. Um, and China is also home to very young, diverse populations, uh, people who look very much like yourselves, um, that are also transforming the landscape, um, as well as global industries. So I just want to put this image of um, not just of China youth, but also of its people to give you a sense of how quickly uh, China um, has changed. So the first part of my talk is about consuming citizenship. And what I'm going to argue uh, in this section is the fact that uh, in addition to um, becoming new global citizens, uh, China is also home to new consumers as well. And in some ways, these have really become intertwined in many ways. Um, both domestic uh, policy makers in China, as well as international corporations, continue to shape uh, the markets in China. Um, and I do want to emphasize that there's also new social worlds that come as a result of that, uh, and experiences of desire. Um, so, you know, what I do is to focus on three specific sites. Uh, I focus on food, uh, I focus on medicine, and of course biotechnology to give you a sense of uh, that consumership. So, uh, I don't know if all of you can read that slide, uh, but I just want to give you a sense of uh, some uh, statistics about 
uh, why it's important to pay attention to consumption. Uh, China is very quickly becoming, uh, trying to become a nation of middle class. Uh, it's a huge middle class and something to think about. Um, I didn't put up a, a comparative note, but uh, the British middle class is only 80 million. Uh, the Chinese middle class is poised to be 10 times larger. So just think about you know, that statistic alone and think about how different it is. Um, I have other figures up there that really talks a little bit about consumer spending. Um, and these are figures, of course, that are already outdated. Uh, this is already four years ago. So the figure in 20, 2008 from the Asian Development Bank was uh, 4.3 trillion. Um, and this is estimated to go up in the next uh, two decades, um, uh, literally eightfold. So you can really see how quickly uh, it's transformed. Um, now, these new forms of materiality and intensive commodification uh, infuse everyday life. Um, it's important to recognize that you know one of the ways in which uh, citizens became transformed into consumers really uh, occurred during the 1990s. So this didn't occur you know out of the blue. Um, a lot of the uh, the transformation was taking place in the post mill period. So uh, uh, over two decades ago, uh, the uh, big pharmaceutical companies started to uh, enter uh, the Chinese market. Um, and it, it didn't just enter in any way, they literally became infused in everyday life. Um, so that you could see this on the streets. Uh, it was not just in the clinics or the hospitals, but it was literally on the streets that you could see this transformation of daily life. Uh, the search for well-being and the use of uh, new technologies uh, trans animated a lot of uh, daily life here and consumption. And so notions of the good life, uh, how to you know, pursue good health and wealth and prosperity, was really through the consumption of medical goods, uh, through um, uh, medicinal products and beauty aids. Um, this is not a new concept. Uh, however, uh, what I argue is that the, the expansion of materialism uh, during this period actually uh, enabled that, um, those possibilities. So consuming medicine, as I uh, want to argue, is it's increasingly a marker of the significance of a person's location in the new economy of bodies. So it's not just citizenship, but personhood. Uh, the very fact of who you are as a person is very much uh, defined by what you consume and how you consume. Uh, pharmaceutical firms basically capitalized on this fact, uh, and this is something that uh, it should be interesting to note. Uh, Chinese citizens actually consume and spend far more on not just prescription drugs, but actually over-the-counter medications um, than any of their counterparts in the United States or in Europe. So, for instance, by contrast, uh, here in the United States, uh, we spend about 8% of our GDP on, um, on medical care and medicine. Uh, in Germany, it's slightly higher. It's actually 12%. Uh, but in China, 60%. Uh, Okay, of the average household will spend their you know, um, total, health health, uh, total household expenditures uh, on health uh, care. It's a huge expense. Um, part of it has to do with the fact that uh, uh, Chinese hospitals, uh, basically uh, as with factories during the 1990s uh, becoming uh, defunded uh, by the state, um, a lot of the hospitals had to uh, increase their revenue uh, by basically uh, writing more prescriptions. Um, that was one of the ways in which they could gain more income, more revenue uh, for the hospital. So, uh, as hospitals began to prescribe more medication, and this isn't, it, it wasn't just medication, it was also related to technology. So, the more CAT scans, the more x-rays, uh, the more uh, different technologies you could charge uh, for uh, enabled more revenue for hospitals. So during the late 20th century, uh, this boom, you know, this uh, pharma pharmaceutical boom, uh, really transformed uh, the domestic market. So that uh, people basically had began to really uh, consider and think about, well, what is it that you know that we need and want? Um, it's hard to see in this image, but there's a uh, uh, this is a poster inside of a pharmaceutical uh, store, uh, just a local pharmacy, and you can see the certificates at the very top, but. Um, I thought this poster was fascinating because it kind of represents the, the ideal nuclear family now, right? You have um, a, pa a pair of elderly parents, 
uh, with their children, presumably with their uh, son and, and daughter-in-law. Um, and you can just see that you know the, this, they're representing the, the good life. Now, during the uh, 1990s and well into the present, uh, advertisements of over-the-counter drugs uh, for headaches, uh, indigestion, uh, children's colds have been televised. Uh, they've been printed in um, the media, uh, both uh, newspapers and magazines, as well as uh, social media. And these brands were usually produced by a transnational company uh, with a name translated for the, uh, for the local market. And so these commercials uh, often had vivid images of a Chinese person uh, suffering with a headache or a stomach ache, uh, heart pain, indigestion, uh, and taking the drug for immediate relief. Um, and other commercials, very similar to this poster, you know, portrayed family images where the mother would administer the drug to her children uh, or to her elderly parents. So uh, those were not just for Western drugs, but that was also true for uh, traditional medicines as well. So there was a way in which um, uh, for uh, Chinese medicines, they would often have the image of the animal or the plant uh, from which the um, herbal medicine had been derived from. And they would uh, show that you know, this was again um, being given to uh, Chinese patients. So what I wanted to show here was basically uh, looking at uh, one of the other ways in which uh, the pharmaceutical industry is starting to really take hold uh, in everyday life. Uh, this is actually an image from uh, downtown Shanghai. Uh, this is an example of the street pharmacies, uh, the street clinics that actually opened up. Um, during the weekends, uh, when I first lived in China uh, in the 1980s, I lived and worked there um, from 1985 to 1987. I uh, had a gap two years between college and graduate school. Um, and so, you know, at that time, uh, weekends were only one a day. You know, Sundays were the only day off. Um, and so uh, people would have a half day on Saturday. And so uh, weekends were basically really, really rushed. It was just a, a day and a half. Um, in 1990, uh, the weekend got expanded. So officially, China expanded its weekend to two days. And what that meant was that there was a new newfound leisure time. Uh, people began to have more leisure and to be able to um, you know, walk the streets, to be able to uh, go shopping, to, and they were encouraged to by the state. They were actually expected to. So, you know, department stores and uh, in most cities would actually be filled with uh, large crowds of consumers uh, checking out the, the latest uh, goods um, and often promote, you know, accompanied with promotional deals. And so one of the things that really struck me as I was walking you know, uh, around and exploring uh, the cities, uh, mostly Beijing and Shanghai, was really this phenomenon of the street clinic. Um, and it's a really interesting phenomenon because you can see here, there's a row of uh, clinicians uh, in white lab coats. Um, and they're not simply pharmacists. Uh, as you know here, if you go to Walgreens or if you go to CVS, um, if you go to any pharmacy, uh, what you'll find is that um, you'll see um, uh, pharmacists usually wearing the lab coats and uh, they'll tell you about that particular drug. Uh, what happened here in China was that the uh, local pharmacies would hire retired physicians, uh, either uh, med Chinese medical physicians or uh, uh, those physicians trained in Western medicine. And kind of a side note, it's important to know that uh, Chinese physicians, whether they go to a biomedical, um, whether they get an MD, or if they get a, a doctorate in Chinese medicine, they often have training in both systems. So, um, you know, if you get an MD in biomedicine, you actually often will have had a year in TCM, and vice versa. So if you go to college in traditional Chinese medicine, you often will have a year of uh, Western medicine. So, you know, most Chinese physicians actually have a lot of cross-training, and that's very, very different than uh, what you see in other countries. So anyway, uh, these basically, these representatives, uh, these physicians would basically um, be in a line, and you can see the consumers um, slash patients coming there to seek out medical help. And one of the things I did, you know, I interviewed uh, quite a few physicians as well as uh, the patients, and I'd say, well, why, you know, why, why do you go here and go to a hospital? I actually knew the reason why, but I, I was curious. I wanted to find out, you know, what they had to say. Um, and basically, they all said, well, 
well, of course we go to, you know, we'd love to go to the hospital, but it's impossible to get in. Um, it's impossible to get drugs, and ultimately, you know, it's just so much easier to come here. It's convenient, you know, I do my shopping, and then, you know, the, there's, uh, there's so many pharmacies. Uh, one of the things I did was to actually count how many pharmacies there were along Nanjing Road, which is the major, it's kind of like Fifth Avenue, uh, the equivalent of Fifth Avenue in Shanghai. There were over 20 pharmacies just in two blocks. Okay. So it just shows you, you know, this was a, a moment where um, the, not just the street pharmacies, but the pharmaceutical industry was really saturating the market, trying to transform um, citizens into consumers, right? Hopefully consuming um, uh, over-the-counter medication. And so the people that I interviewed uh, that would be you know, uh, coming to the uh, street clinics, they just basically say it's so much more convenient. Um, if ever you go to a Chinese hospital, uh, oftentimes um, they're inside uh, old buildings that have not been renovated. Uh, uh, in the early uh, 2000s, uh, tiny, tiny windows, right? So a window maybe about this big uh, might have 20 hands trying to, uh, to get their prescriptions filled. And then you never saw the person who was uh, filling the prescription they would just literally, you know, take the prescription and then, you know, toss it out. So it's this very interesting, you know, faceless image. By contrast, if you went to a street pharmacy, you could actually get, you know, uh, you, you could talk to someone who had tons of experience. Um, if they were retired, they would probably had at least served for 20 to 30 years. They had a lot of knowledge um, about um, uh, different uh, ailments. And they would actually, uh, alongside, next to them, would be, uh, representatives of the pharmaceutical firms also wearing white lab coats they, and they would have you know um, uh, samples as well as literature um, about their drugs and really show off the latest uh, medical technology um, so you know lots of, you know you instantly stick your finger into a medical device it would not only take your pulse and uh, Western medicine would take your pulse in Chinese medicine and it'd give you a printout and say, well, your spleen is a bit, you know, uh, overworked. You need to take care of yourself. You need to eat this, this, this. So there were uh, amazing things that were happening um, on the streets. In addition to medical technology, uh, I do want to mention that there was a lot of cosmetics, a lot of beauty aids that were also um, being sold um, at the pharmacy. So, uh, you know, beauty aids for the face, for the skin, uh, for the body, uh, weight reduction pills, um, slimming teas. Uh, these are things that we see, of course, here in, uh, in this country. Um, but you have to remember when it first emerged uh, during the late 90s, in the early uh, 2000s, this was a, a, a vast transformation. So basically, um, you know, these array of goods have really transformed uh, notions of health. Uh, as well as wealth and happiness. And uh, what I'm going to argue is that uh, the ideals of health, wealth, and happiness, these are things that, you know, when you uh, see someone for Chinese New Year's, you know, you'll, you'll say, you know, um, good fortune, you know, um, uh, in Cantonese, gong hei fa choi, right? Um, in Mandarin, gong xi fa tai, but it's, it's this notion of, you know, wishing you um, good prosperity. Um, so these notions of health, wealth, and happiness are still important ideals, but the ways in which you achieve them um, are really through consumption. And that's really the, the, the vast uh, revolution and transformation that's taking place. Um, appearance and the body have returned to um, as sites of individual um, control and uh, as well as social order. Uh, and one of the things that sometimes you might find uh, still, which is amazing, you'll see products that have before and after, right? We often see this in this country for our acne medication, right? Where you see someone who had, might have a severe case and then it was transformed. Uh, they have the same thing uh, in China as well. Um, one of the other things that I didn't have too many slides about, but I do want to say that you have to remember um, in the... Uh, after the first decade, so the last decade was really about the introduction of all these new goods. The last decade, the most recent decade, however, has been the introduction of new epidemics. Uh, we now hear about SARS, we hear about bird flu, uh, uh, HIV AIDS uh, is another pandemic, that these have also influenced deeply um, the uh, notions of Chinese consumption, as well as uh, what I would call fearful consumption, uh, that uh, people consume vitamins, uh, antibiotics, uh, as a way to prevent or to, uh, to ward off um, concerns about epidemics. 
And the image you actually have here, uh, one of the other um, uh, things I did for my research was I actually, when I interviewed people, if it happened to be in their homes, I would say, can I look at your medicine cabinet or you know, where you store um, your medicines? Um, and that was a really interesting cultural move because uh, in this country, you know, oftentimes, you know, uh, people might store their medications. You know, just think about where do you store your medications? Bathroom, right? Um, in China, people would say, and I would tell them, I would say, you know, a lot of American households they store their medications in the bathroom. They would be horrified. They would say, how could you do this? You know, you have to remember now, the average Chinese household spends 60% of its income on medication, right? And so, uh, for them, it was a moment of display. So, for instance, uh, this is uh, an elderly, this, uh, uh, you know, an auntie, you know, um, not my relation, but, you know, someone who I would call auntie. And I would, you know, um, I would just say, can I take a photo of your medications? And she literally had a whole table, a whole cabinet. It was very elaborately spread. I mean, she took everything. She could name every uh, pill, what, you know, medication it was. Um, and it was not just, it was not in the uh, bathroom. You could see it was in the living room, right? It was like this, you could see some whole altars of display. Um, and so when I explained that American households most commonly kept their you know, uh, medications inside the bathroom, they would go, why? Why would you, you know, for them, the bathroom is considered a very um, dirty place, right? It's, it's, you know, the notion of uh, uh, purity versus um, unclean. And so the notion of, you know, having this in, in that space was for them un unfathomable. So it's important to begin thinking about, um, you know, food and medication, not just uh, in terms of, um, separate categories, but to realize that uh, what, what I'm going to do in the, in the rest of this talk is to really begin thinking about these categories as very interrelated. And for those of you who are taking um, nutrition with Professor Chen Maynard, um, you, many of you already know this, that you know food is medicine, that food is medication. Um, but I'm, I'm mostly focusing on medicine in this first part of the talk. Now, I'm going to be switching to another part of the talk, which is really looking about uh, what began to happen uh, after the pharmaceutical uh, revolution. Um, very quickly, uh, uh, as um, the new economy, uh, the new market economy took off, uh, it was possible to not only find, you know, for instance, uh, Prozac and Viagra at these three clinics, um, but it was also possible to find fake Viagra, fake Prozac, fake um, medications. And so uh, it's, you know, I just want to take a few minutes to step back and think about fakes because um, uh, uh, consumption can often be mimetic. Uh, mimetic is uh, to be a copy, right? We hear about memes all the time. Um, but fakes are, uh, they're really a reflection about the mimetic uh, property of consumption. In other words, if a brand is popular enough, then that means there are probably spin-offs, right? So here we have a classic example of the Louis Vuitton bag, uh, which uh, if you go to any street market in China, you'll see a lot of uh, fake uh, bags with different you know, brand names and logos. Um, however, it's one thing to talk about clothing or uh, jewelry or about uh, purses or shoes or athletic goods. It's another thing when we're talking about food and medicine. And in this decade, uh, Chinese consumers have been very, very concerned about the quality and the purity of their foods and drugs and drinks. Um, because in this case, the knowledge um, about uh, the real or the fake is actually a matter of life and death. Um, and what I'm, what I'm going to argue here, too, is that Chinese consumers are kind of on the front lines of the global assembly line that uh, the concerns of citizens in China are shared by many people in the world today. Um, as uh, uh, many of you have probably uh, read about the fact that uh, there have been concerns about uh, pet food, for instance, that uh, had uh, melamine contamination, uh, milk products that actually also have melamine uh, contamination, uh, toys with, uh, with lead products. Uh, this is actually in front of a um, uh, a toy factory, uh, where the toys, uh, when they were tested, uh, they found that the, the, the level of uh, lead inside the paint was so high that it was quite toxic. So there have been a lot of calls and, uh, for uh, oversight. Um, 
concerning the production lines. Um, there's the, the Chinese Food and Drug Administration has gone through a massive overhaul. Uh, its safety program has been thoroughly reviewed. Um, this had to uh, do with the fact that um, uh, there have been so many deaths related to uh, contaminated milk, for instance, uh, milk formula, uh, that actually even a few officials at the state and provincial level uh, were executed because they, there were these concerns about you know, how these fake goods were circulating. So, you know, in this context, uh, one of the questions I also ask is, you know, what's the role of the anthropologist? You know, what, what, what can anthropology do? How can we uh, make a difference? Um, and I think uh, what I'm going to argue is the fact that I think what we do is somewhat, it's not so much slow journalism, but it's really a, a way of witnessing. It's a way of uh, bearing witness and documenting. Uh, what we can do best is really to document and to really uh, frame these stories that are happening at the ground, on the ground for people, but also to tell the big story of what's happening with regard to China. So uh, in this next section, what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, biotechnology in particular, because I want what I'm going to argue is that uh, in the Chinese context, biotechnology is situated as a matter of life over death. Okay? That Chinese biotechnology is a moment where the biosciences and scientific knowledge come together to enable a very different formula, a very different framework for, uh, for governance. So in this section, I'm going to talk a little bit about Chinese biotechnology. I begin with this image of the double helix. Uh, this is a sculpture, of course, inside a sign, um, at the entrance of a science park in Beijing. And uh, over throughout China now, there are dozens of science parks. Uh, it's you know they're mostly industrial parks where various biotech companies can uh, you know do their work, but also uh, do research. Uh, and it's not so much for retail, but it's more for production. Um, what I think is important is to recognize that uh, this is a very particular moment of endangerment and vulnerability, right? Consumers are very concerned about, is this real? Uh, is this you know, milk formula that I'm purchasing for my child the real thing? Or is this something we have to worry about later on you know, for, about contamination? So what's been very interesting, it's too bad you can't see the slide here, but uh, at the very top right here, it actually says honest scientific and technology. And I actually took a picture of this just because I love the name. Um, that there's a huge, huge um, value being placed on honesty and accountability. There's a way in which um, the biotech industry is really situating itself as uh, we are the solution. We are really providing um, the, 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 we're meeting the needs and we're going to uh, figure out a way to uh, resolve concerns about vulnerability. Now, one of the things I haven't really talked about yet is the notion of food security. Um, the, this section is actually called Feeding the Nation. And um, I do want to spend a little bit to talk about the population concern because uh, one of the things we hear about all the time is you know, similar to that slide that I showed with the 800 million uh, middle class citizens is the concerns, like, how are we going to feed all these people, right? Uh, China's a, uh, uh, a country of uh, officially 1.3, very quickly to become 1.6 billion people, okay? Now, to kind of give you a sense of what 0.3 billion, what that difference would be, uh, the U.S. population is just a little bit over 300 million, okay? So 0.3 billion is literally adding the whole U.S. population in the next two decades. So this is the, you know, some of the material concerns uh, that the country is facing. Uh, the government is trying to figure out, well, how are we going to feed this, this population? How are we going to meet the needs? So added to that is the fact of cultural memory. Um, cultural memory is really thinking in terms of you know, stories that you might have heard when you were growing up and how you remember, uh, you know, uh, so you might talk to your parents, you might talk to your grandparents, uh, you might talk to uh, uh, elders in your community, and they might actually give you stories about how different uh, the world might have been. And so in China, uh, when people think about food, they also think about the absence of food. It's not just about the abundance, but it's also, um, you know, very, it, it wasn't, you know, the, uh, 
uh, the uh, People's Republic is still very young. It's only uh, 60 years old. And so historically, there's a cultural memory of uh, starvation um, about, for instance, the Great Leap Forward um, and other famines, right? Um, and even though, for instance, I was uh, raised in this country, um, I still eat as if I, you know, was uh, someone who was raised in the 1920s or 1930s. I never throw away any food. Um, I always figure out how to keep, you know, scraps, and I literally, you know, I can make a meal out of nothing, right? So I'll look in, the, in my fridge and I'll say, okay, I have this, this, this. Uh, don't, it, I never let it go to waste. And you probably, you know, some of you are nodding, some of you are like, yeah, I like that too, right? Because if you're students, you're probably, uh, you know, concerned about this as well. But, uh, you know, in my household, uh, I grew up with stories of starvation. You know, my mom would tell me stories about when she was young and she went hungry. And so there's this, you know, deep-seated fear um, and concern. And this is not just in, you know, say one household, uh, one family. This is um, a national story. It's a cultural memory. And so, given that context, biotechnology is really considered to be a savior, okay? It's not the problem compared to the United States or Europe, because when you hear about biotechnology, you know, here in the U.S. we actually are much more sanguine about biotechnology as well, but if you, uh, if you look uh, and talk to European consumers, they're deeply concerned um, about biotechnology. In China, it's considered to be the solution for meeting the needs of the world's largest population. And it's also uh, a way to uh, take care of issues, not just for food shortage, but also for health care. So there's an incredible aggressive promotion of this, not by um, pharmaceutical front companies, but actually by the government, by the Chinese state. Um, because there's this intensity of knowledge making and the belief that um, that there's a way in which uh, this new technology can meet all the needs. And so this is another fascinating slide. Uh, biotechnology is framed as natural, okay? It's framed as, you know, not only uh, producing, for instance, you know, proteins um, um, and, you know, antibiotics, but if you look at the bottom part over here, cos cosmetics, nutraceuticals, food, pharma, so there's this whole way in which uh, biotechnology is really framed as creating all these new things, all these possibilities uh, for, uh, for a new life. And so what I find fascinating about biotechnology is that how it becomes inscribed as Chinese, okay? Uh, we tend to think of it as a scientific uh, uh, endeavor uh, and that companies uh, create these products. Um, but what I argue is that uh, in China, Biotechnology has really uh, enabled a certain type of sovereignty, uh, what I call a bio-sovereignty, uh, such that uh, it allows the biosciences to, uh, to be the platform for notions of modernity and national progress. Uh, particularly, uh, you, know, you have to remember the Asian financial crisis that took place during the 1990s. Um, in the present moment, um, a lot of Asian countries, uh, but especially in China, uh, have embraced biotechnology um, and have literally uh, invested uh, in, in this industry. It's very different than uh, what's happening in this country. Uh, in this country, biotechnology was pretty much embraced by uh, private corporations. So it's been very privatized as opposed to uh, in China, which it's very much a state uh, endeavor. So interestingly enough, uh, consumers um, are really raised in this context in which the market and biotechnology are conjoined. So this is at a biotech uh, fair where uh, it was not just industry people figuring out, you know, what products do I need to buy and how am I going to um, uh, get the goods that I need to, to make new products. They were actually displaying youth items. So they were actually, uh, you can't see it too well, but uh, there's this product called Echo Bio Green. So uh, it was a way in which you know, put these stones uh, that are filled with certain uh, bio-engineered uh, compounds, you put them inside polluted streams or polluted ponds, and it would gradually clean up uh, the polluted source of water. So people, people could do this around their home, they could do this uh, in their fish tank, uh, wherever they felt like they needed to clean up uh, the water. Um, this is the other product which I thought was fascinating. Uh, so, uh, double helix water. Um, <laughs> you know, when we think about here in this country, you know, um, how many of you buy, you know, vitamin water or smart water? 
couple of you, right? Right. But water is actually one of the most interesting uh, commodities that are uh, that's you know uh, out there because uh, there's uh, tremendous uh, investment. It's actually one of the easiest products to you know where the um, uh, uh, profit margin or the profit ratio is extremely high because you're really not adding that much. You just add a couple of vitamins and then you know you make a huge profit margin. Uh, as a result. So double helix water is another product that's been uh, produced as a way to get um, Chinese consumers to uh, consume biotechnology. So the expansion, uh, not just in China, but also uh, across Asia with biotechnology has really been referred to as a biotech bloom, right? Uh, where it's uh, gone beyond just being an uh, assembly line for genomic um, research or sequencing, um, but actually uh, the production of knowledge really reflects an increasing techno-scientific culture, right, where uh, it's not just researchers or scientists that are doing the, uh, the work, but it's really uh, ordinary people who are really just, you know, saying, yeah, that's great, you know, vit vitamin water, double helix water, sure, you know, I'll purchase this. And it's a very different uh, way. What I'm going to do now is turn to the story of rice, because uh, I want to talk about um, the rice genome. And uh, I actually have to say, I've been fascinated with rice uh, over uh, probably for the past two or three years now. So first of all, let me first of all uh, situate and talk a little bit about the human genome, because when we think about rice, we often think of it uh, as, wow, I didn't know that. Uh, as we know, um, in the year 2000, the human genome was mapped and sequenced. There was a race between a public team and a, race, and a, um, and a private team. Uh, and the, uh, the end of the story was that basically the public team won. Um, and so in 2000, uh, uh, President uh, Clinton was president then. Uh, he actually held up uh, a CD which, had a, which basically was a copy of the human genome. And uh, similar to the human genome race, the rice genome was also a race. And it was a race between a public team and a private team. Uh, the private team was primarily uh, funded by Monsanto, uh, which we know is an uh, agribusiness, uh, which uh, has uh, done a lot of research uh, on, you know, for instance, uh, the Terminator seeds, uh, did a lot of uh, very controversial um, policies concerning who could have access. Um, and as we all know right now, um, a number of farmers, uh, I believe 10,000 farmers that actually are in court right now suing Monsanto. So uh, there's some fascinating activism uh, that's happening around, around that. Uh, so before I get into the race, I just do want to talk a little bit about um, this focus on rice and you know, why rice. Uh, one of the reasons why I focus on rice uh, it has to do with you know, um, going back to cultural memory. Um, when I was growing up as a kid, my mom would always say, you know, she'd tell me these stories, you better eat every grain of rice because if you don't, um, your partner in life is going to have, for every speck of rice you don't eat, it's going to show up as a, you know, pimple or you know, <laughs> um, intended. And so you're, there I was, you know, as a kid, eating every speck of rice because I was terrified, thinking, oh my God, you know. Uh, she didn't, you know, she was smart. She figured out, you know, you know, I didn't care if I didn't finish for me, but she would say, you know, well, you've got to finish because, you know, uh, it's, it's a funny story. Um, but then uh, she would also tell these incredible stories about how, you know, uh, uh, rice uh, has a double harvest, in which you actually have to um, cultivate it. You cultivate it and then you replant it. And so it, the intensive cultivation is actually uh, an incredible uh, story in and of itself. And so she said, you know, whoever planted rice, you know, that farmer uh, did backbreaking labor. And so you do not want to waste any grain of rice because it's incredibly important. So there's a way in which, you know, rice is very much part of my cultural memory, um, uh, the stories that I grew up uh, as a, you know, just, just the individual. But then I began to think about, well, why rice? You know, what's going on? Why would they focus on rice in China? Uh, well, actually, it's the food source for over half the world uh, that the majority of the world's population eats rice, not other grains. This is the most common grain. Um, and actually, the interesting part about rice is that the genomic structure uh, of, and of, the, of this one, of Orsia sativa, which ultimately became sequenced, um, is really the kind of the foundation or platform for sequencing other grains, such as um, 
such as corn or wheat. Um, and so it's interesting that, uh, that a lot of people, a lot of scientists believe that rice can be the model for sequencing any grain, ultimately. So it's kind of like uh, if you had a foundation um, sequence, this would be the foundation. But the story of the rice genome sequence is a really fascinating one. So basically, during the 1980s, uh, there was a public team of 12 nations that uh, initiate, was initiated with Japan's uh, founding of the rice genome uh, research project. And this basically became a collaborative international project uh, in 1997. Um, there was uh, countries such as you know, Japan, the US, South Korea, uh, UK, uh, then Canada and Thailand, uh, as well as France, Taiwan, India, and Brazil. Um, and so basically the 12 rice genomes were divided up amongst all the uh, participant countries. And then as soon as the sequence uh, had been mutated, uh, the consortium would share its knowledge and then make it public. Uh, this was considered to be a really slow way to sequence. Um, now, similar to any bioscience, uh, private capital has a huge effect in the way the rice genome would be uh, you know, sequenced. And so Monsanto uh, was able to draft a sequence. But there was a Faustian deal. In other words, uh, if you were a scientist and if you wanted to have access to the Monsanto sequence, you actually had to uh, sign away your rights, basically. That any knowledge that you gained from that sequence um, uh, had to be, it was the property of Monsanto. So, you know, again, you can see this issue of public and private, you know, for whose good, for whose knowledge. Uh, so eventually, uh, there became two teams, uh, one led by uh, 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 Sygenta, which is a Swiss pharmaceutical firm, and then uh, by the Beijing Genomic Institute and the University of Washington. And basically, uh, the Chinese focus was really on the super rice. Uh, there's a hybrid rice um, that has higher yield because they're very concerned about not just um, having a stronger rice strain, but something that could actually yield more rice than, than ever. So what happened was that uh, ultimately the public team leapfrogged over the private team. And what happened was that in year 2001, the Beijing Genomics Institute was able to sequence this. Um, and they published it in Nature in Science. So very similar to the human genome story, the rice genome story is also about you know, how, uh, uh, in a sense, the public team won. But I'm going to argue and suggest that it wasn't just a story between public and private, but this is what was the birth of Chinese biotech. But this was the moment in which Chinese biotechnology started to become preeminent. So today, uh, if you go to Beijing Genomics Institute, they actually are not just based in Beijing, they're located all over the country. Um, and they actually uh, collaborate with uh, UCSC, for instance. So uh, one of the things that they've contracted to UCSC is to kind of do this Noah's Ark of uh, 300 of the most uh, important plants and animals uh, to sequence um, as many plants and animals as they can. They're beginning with 300. Um, but uh, what they're really trying to do is begin to secure uh, biodiversity. And so um, what I'm going to argue here is the fact that, um, that biotechnology in China has really become a national platform. It's about securing uh, not just uh, uh, information uh, in the form of genomic sequences, but it's also about securing uh, uh, the, the notion of, you know, we did it first. And as a result, uh, property of information belongs not to private corporations, but to the state. So it's an interesting, um, you know, transformation. So in China now, there's a lot of research on the commercial applications of uh, transgenic rice or genetically modified rice. Um, farmers in Hubei, which is in central China, uh, they've actually grown GMY seeds, and the crops are mostly sold to scientists. They're, in other words, there is transgenic rice in China, but it's not um, sold. In other words, it's only sold to, it's not sold to the public, it's mostly sold to research uh, uh, scientists. <coughs> the other interesting thing is that uh, initial studies basically show that this rice re requires 80% uh, less pesticide. Okay? So farmers like it because farmers are basically saying, yeah, this is great. The majority of farmers' livelihoods is not just on uh, spending time cultivating you know, uh, crops such as rice, 
but the majority of their income, their expenses, expenditures are actually focused on paying for pesticides. The fact that um, they would not necessarily have to pay as much money for pesticides, you can actually spend that money on, you know, say, a new hybrid rice that would have more yield. Well, it's, it's very obvious. Uh, nonetheless, there's a lot of concern. There's been a lot of testing about you know, the safety of GM rice. Um, and it's, it's an interesting uh, moment because uh, you know, farmers uh, have a lot of knowledge and there's a lot of controversy about you know, genetically modified organisms. Uh, so you know, the farmers have actually been uh, very much cultivated by scientists. You know, very much, you know, there's a very close working relationship between scientists and farmers. And you can see here where they're testing, um, has there been any type of uh, flotation, uh, gene flotation, you know, where you know, uh, the gene pool of certain uh, genetic uh, rice strains you know, hasn't gone elsewhere. So food safety concerns uh, are a big issue. Uh, one of the concerns that people have about genetically modified rice uh, is allergenicity. In other words, you know, are people likely to have more allergies as a result of uh, consuming uh, this type of rice? Um, and then there's also uh, concerns about food quality and food safety. Uh, are, what, what, are, what are the unknowns? Uh, what might be the health impacts of genetically modified foods? So, I, what I'd like to do here is kind of, you know, turn to the question then of what to eat. Because so far we've been looking at China, we've been looking at, you know, how uh, the medical system has transformed, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry uh, really um, became part of everyday life. And then also we have this new uh, entity called Chinese biotechnology that is also shaping uh, not just medicine, but also food. And so, you know, uh, the reason why I have this slide up is that this is the discourse we're most familiar with. Uh, if you go to Europe, there's intense, intense concern about genetically modified foods. Um, there's a lot of concern about, well, you know, how, you know, what is, what is going to be safe to eat, right? And so uh, in Europe, as well as in the United States, there's this notion of frankenfoods, that, you know, these are foods that are disguised to be, you know, safe and normal, but in actuality, uh, this is actually very, very uh, unsafe. And, um, you know, in addition to these concerns about food safety, um, you know, I have the question what to eat, because we are constantly bombarded uh, every day with what to eat. It's not just you know, at the end of the day when you go home and you're opening the refrigerator, refrigerator and you're going, oh my gosh, what am I going to eat? You know, what leftovers are there in there? <laughs> or how am I going to, you know, make something? Uh, what's going to be the best thing to make? It's not just that question that you face, you know, um, on a daily basis. It's also the question of what is healthy food? What is good food? Uh, what is good for me? What is good for my family? What is good for my body? Um, that the notion of what to eat is also constantly being shifted um, by um, not just the popular media, but also scientific uh, knowledge, right? Uh, the notions of what is a healthy diet? Uh, what is uh, a good diet, right? If you think about the Paleolithic diet, diet right? Uh, the Atkins diet, um, all these different types of diets, uh, where it's, whether it's counting calories, whether it's uh, eating more fruits and vegetables, uh, the low carb diet, uh, all of these uh, are all about uh, ideologies. These are food ideologies. And ultimately, food ideologies are about how you see the world, how you categorize the world, and where you put yourself in that world. Um, in how you view um, the category of good or bad, uh, uh, the, um, the pure and the safe. That these are uh, very, very prominent questions. Um, uh, everyone, whether or not you are a slow food uh, local board, or if you are, um, uh, say, someone who you know, completely you know, buys everything that's pre-made and pre-packaged, uh, the question of what to eat is something that is uh, something that makes everyone think about it. So, you know, what I do in anthropology is I train my students to think about uh, food as both material and symbolic. That uh, these are the two realms in which we categorize our food. Uh, that these foundations shape how we uh, think about food uh, as a symbolic practice, uh, but also food is a material practice as well. Uh, in other words, we eat to live, right? So we have the survivor story, but we also live to eat, right? So this is the, the gourmet story, right? That we, 
you know, it's, there, there are different types of eating. There's eating where you're just, you know, making sure you have, you know, hand, hand to mouth and making sure you get enough calories and survive and get through life. Uh, but there are also ways in which we also consider, you know, that we live to eat, you know, and um, I should say that uh, most people presume I grew up here in California. I didn't. I grew up in Louisiana. Um, and if ever you've been to Louisiana, uh, people take their food very seriously. Um, it doesn't matter if you're, um, uh, if you're you know, um, uh, Asian or uh, Native American, uh, African American or, you know, Cajun, uh, everyone there takes their food very, very seriously. And so we live to eat. And there are different types of engagement around food, as you know. Uh, there's not just physical and social needs, uh, but there are very, very elaborate notions of belonging, notions of etiquette, right? How you use the knife and fork, or how you use your chopsticks, um, as well as you know uh, the uh, the food system, and thinking about you know the production line and the consumption commodity chain, uh, community engagement uh, and activism. These are all forms of ways in thinking about food, and so. Uh, anthropology of food is really trying to train people to think about food not just as a substance or as a symbolic practice, but that these two come together in really important ways. So I kind of begin with that to then turn to thinking about uh, the notion of savoring. Because when we think about, uh, with, so far I've really mostly talked about consumption. And the, the title of this talk is called Unsavoring and Consumption or saving and consuming. Um, you know, as we know, consuming is really uh, not just about, you know, the act of eating food, but it's about, you know, um, consuming a new lifestyle, right? Becoming a consuming citizen, such as in China. Um, but I want to kind of think about the notion of savoring. What does it mean to savor or to enjoy or to really taste? Uh, and this is actually... Uh, one of the things I uh, didn't have a chance to, to bring, I'm just curious, this is a little anecdote, but um, how many of you have heard of miracle fruit? Or a dulcy berry? Okay, Professor uh, Chen Maynard has, but uh, uh, miracle fruit, and I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide uh, for this. Uh, miracle fruit is a berry, it's from the dulcy plant, and uh, you can actually consume this in terms, you can consume it as an actual berry, or you can actually they now basically make it in powder form, they make it in uh, tablet form. Uh, what happens is that it transforms your sensations of taste. Um, so if you take the Miracle tablet or if you have a bite of the Miracle fruit, uh, things that normally used to be really, really sour, so if you imagine a lemon, or what, 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 what might be some of the uh, examples of uh, the most sour thing you've ever had? Grapefruit, right? Okay, so imagine something really, and just even talking about these make me salivate, right? Do you find yourself starting to like, you know, salivate and go, oh, that's really, you pucker up and go, wow, that's really sour. So if you take miracle fruit, or if you take a derivative in tablet form, uh, it actually makes these incredibly sweet. And then if you taste something that's super sweet, it tastes like chalk. So um, uh, during the uh, past decades, tasting parties, uh, and I actually uh, was giving a, uh, a talk at the Institute for the Future and actually purchased the miracle fruit. And so we had a reception afterwards. And so they had lined up, you know, foods and vegetables and, um, you know, candies. And so we had, we tasted some of it before. And then afterwards, we, in the middle, we, you know, rinse our palate and we would actually take the miracle, uh, we had the tablets. And then we taste the foods again, and it was unbelievable. All the things that were sweet, uh, completely, oh, it was just nasty. It, it tasted horrible, right? And then things that you know were normally would not consume, uh, that you know, such as garlic, such as you know, uh, you know, raw, right, in, in raw form, uh, completely transformed the flavor. Now, what might be some of the health dimensions of this? What do you think would uh, be the benefits of this? Well, diet, from a dietary perspective, uh, it might be helpful for diabetics or people who are sweet tooths, right? People who like sweets, and so it might reduce the consumption of sweetness uh, to, you know, to have more healthy foods. Um, you do have to be careful about, you know, acidic burn, right? So if you're eating up, you know, so it was so funny because at this tasting party, all the limes, all the lemons, all the grapefruits, all the really sour, sour things. Um, the bitter greens, they were gone, right? So, you know, the people were like chewing on um, 
you know, green onions, you know, as I felt like we were at a, uh, you know, farmer's market. We were literally, you know, eating all the greens up, and all the sweets were literally, you know, that table was still full. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, uh, give that example as a way to begin thinking about the, the notion of savoring. Uh, we have been trained to think about taste as if it were solely scientific. Okay? We think about taste, you know, how many of you grew up with the notion of the, the four flavors, right? Bitter, sweet, salty, I forgot, what's the last one? Sour, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and what's interesting is that uh, we presume that this is universal, that everyone uh, has the same taste. Sure, we can think about this in terms of the universal, but I'm going to argue that we are also very, very, we are cultural beings. We are very much shaped by culture. And so uh, what we do is, in anthropology is to figure out, well, how does the culture shape those categories? You know, what is it about a culture that prefers hot foods or spicy foods or, you know, other cultures to really prefer bland foods, you know, that, you know, uh, you know uh, and, you know, as an individual, you, uh, you need to re realize that, you know, every family is a culture too, that certain families, uh, your family culture might belong to the, the bland uh, and prefer very bland foods, but then you might be the one who really just, you know, downs jalapenos like nothing, right? That you're constantly, you know, Tabasco, yeah, I'll give it to me, I'll put it in my, I'll put it in my eggs, I'll put it in my, you know, tea, I'll put it anywhere, right? So, um, so taste is a very, very fundamental um, factor that determines not only who you are as a person, but it also determines who you are as a cultural being. It's something that really shapes your world. And so um, I began with this notion of uh, medicinal foods and cultural foods because uh, in a lot of traditional medicines, um, and I'm going to talk about the big three, uh, uh, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic, and um, Greco-Islamic, uh, that these three systems of traditional medicine all consider food as the front line that there was never a separation. There's never uh, a notion that food is not medicine. That if you are ill, one of the first things that happens is that you actually are, um, uh, you know, a physician might say, well, what have you been eating? What's been in your diet, right? So for how many of you, I'm curious in here, when you are not well, how many of you find that you change your food, your diet right away? Like you immediately realize you, you have to eat something different. That few? I, I really thought more of you would be raising your hands. But the majority, you know, some of you might, you know, end up taking more over-the-counter right, medication. Uh, but I would argue that uh, the majority of people who have encountered some uh, form of illness at some point changes their diet uh, tremendously. And this is actually very true in Chinese medicine. I'm going to focus primarily on Chinese medicine since that's my expertise. But um, I, you know, want to say that, you know, during the uh, Zhou Dynasty, in the imperial court, um, uh, imagine you're the emperor. Um, who would you pay to, who would you uh, give uh, the highest salary to? Who would you have as your highest ranked employee? Just think about it. Anyone, speak up. Yes, 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 dietitians, thank you. So it was precisely that, that, you know, it wasn't the ministry of, you know, um, of war, it wasn't the general, it wasn't you know, the minister of finance, it was your dietitian. And the dietitian was the, considered not only to be the highest ranked employee, but actually the highest status. Uh, because you know, the knowledge that that person had literally determined the, the well-being of, of the state. That if the emperor is well, not, to, not only did the dietitian live long, uh, but also it was in her or his interest, most of them, uh, to keep the emperor, the you know the emperor well, and so um, so basically, the knowledge of dietitians was incredibly uh, high status. That even more so than a Chinese medical doctor. That the dietitian was ultimately the, the most uh, powerful um, and well um, uh, respected. Um, and you know, food was considered to be energetic. That you know, as we know, you know, different cultures talk about the energies of foods, just like plants and animals. Uh, but that food had this quality of transference, right? We hear of the term transubstantiation, most often in religious or spiritual contexts. But, you know, transubstantiations were literally, you're consuming um, some form of energy, and that energy becomes part of you, right? That's quite amazing. 
Um, and so food items can not only be nourishing, but they can actually be polluting, right? That you can also make yourself unwell um, by consuming things that might not be fresh or might not be good for you. Um, often, uh, the most important commonality between all these three systems was the notion of balance, right? So if you, uh, and you have to remember the four humors was considered to be a very prominent part. So if you were wet or dry, if you were, um, uh, was it humid, and it was wet, dry, something else, that these were all the, the ways in which your body was organized. And so, oh, hot and cold, hot, wet, dry, hot, cold. Uh, so if you were extremely cold, you had to have something that balanced you by having hot foods. If your spleen was considered to be damp, you had to have um, uh, dry foods to, to kind of dry out your system. And so these four different humors, these different properties of food, were the ways in which you could balance yourself and reharmonize yourself um, in a certain way. So, um, so curative foods, healing foods, uh, food is never very, very far from medicine. Um, in a Chinese uh, uh, food ways, uh, what's most interesting is that Cantonese food, the Cantonese uh, food way, is actually the closest to the traditional system of medicinal foods. So soups, porridges, uh, these were the most common ways in which you could take your medicine, that you could eat your medicine. Um, and one of the things I love to say is that uh, I often use the example, and I talk about this in my book, um, uh, in the Chinese language, when people say, have you eaten your medicine? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, in China, when, when people say, they don't say, have you taken your medicine? They'll say, have you eaten your medicine? Right? And that in itself tells you a lot about the, the views about medicine itself, that medicine is not something you passively take as a patient. Medicine is something that you, as a active consumer, an agent in your good, your well-being and your health is actually uh, something that you actively consume, that you eat. So uh, eating medicine is a really central component um, of the Chinese lexicon. It's part of the, the language itself. And that shows you just how that alone tells you a lot about uh, the relationship between food and medicine. So, um, you know, I, I do... Uh, want to have some time for a Q&A, so I'm going to uh, try to wrap up in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I just want to say that food is a critical element of not just individual life, but social life. Uh, and, you know, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, who's a French sociologist, uh, has really observed that, you know, um, notions of taste, notions of distinction uh, for the French middle class was really a form of domination that really became mobilized. So, for instance, there's a reason why, you know, paying attention to how you use a knife or fork, you know, what types of wine to drink, what types of tea to consume, but these are forms of distinction, how you define yourself and distinguish yourself um, around the world. Um, increasingly, uh, earlier as, uh, in the first half of this talk, I talked about, you know, consuming citizenship and I talked about mostly pharmaceuticals, but, you know, fast foods, that's another way in which, you know, uh, new China and new Chinese consumers are changing too. The younger generation, very similar to the younger generation in this country and around the world, are increasingly eating more fast foods, uh, such that obesity and chronic illnesses, you know, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, stroke, Hypertension. These are increasingly becoming uh, number one uh, preventable illnesses uh, that are becoming a cause of morbidity and mortality. Um, and so, it's important to really think about, you know, consuming and consumption, uh, not just in terms of uh, you know traditional knowledge, but also in terms of um, you know how the fast food system is also per, you know in, infiltrated uh, into the food waste. Okay, how many of you have heard of Lumani? Good. So most of you know about the mom. It's the fifth taste. This is actually um, uh, it was something that was discovered um, by the Japanese chemist uh, 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 Kikune Ikeda in 1909. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, this was the, the basis, of the applications of his research uh, quickly became industrialized. Uh, Ajinomoto, uh, which is a uh, Japanese uh, food production company, uh, quickly started producing um, umami as MSG. So monosodium glutamate um, as a flavor enhancer uh, is really one of the uh, results of uh, the discovery of umami. 
Um, the reason why I have this map up is to show you how around the world there are different uh, ways in which you can, uh, you know, associate it with umami. So fish sauce is perhaps one of the most common sources. Um, and if you uh, think about Caesar salad, uh, if you see anchovies, um, there's this uh, fish paste or fish. Um, it's basically uh, decomposed fish that literally became a flavoring uh, for the Roman army. So uh, umami was also a very, very common, you know, uh, not only flavor enhancer, but it's something that traveled uh, with, the, with the Roman Empire uh, as, as well. So, uh, so basically, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, end with this notion of taste and to think about umami because uh, this is a way to, to really think about um, taste. The fifth taste really shows us that there are a lot more sensations that might be yet unnamed. Okay? The, the thing to think about is that what we do in anthropology, we really try to teach people to think outside the box. And the reason why I want to end with taste is to show you that you know what you were raised with, what I was raised with, uh, the four flavors, right, the four tastes. And then when umami came onto the scene, right, uh, uh, which in Japanese just means savory, right, uh, this fifth sensation, this fifth taste, is something that came out of the blue, and then all of a sudden, you know, scientists basically say, well, you know, there's a fifth taste. Well, what about a sixth taste, a seventh taste, an eighth taste, a ninth taste? You know, what um, we can do in this world is really to continue thinking about other possibilities. And what we can do from learning about uh, culture and learning from anthropology is to recognize that there's a lot of uh, experiences and sensations that are yet to be classified, yet to, uh, to be defined. Uh, diets around the world, as you know, are changing. Uh, and this is really the most visible for urban um, uh, generations that actually consume more pre-packaged meals and fast foods. Uh, this is a slide uh, taken by many of you probably know Hungry Planet or Material World. Uh, this is a documentary uh, team, uh, Faith DeLucio and Peter Mitzel, where they've done a number of, uh, they'll actually, uh, for their Material World project, they would ask families to lay out their entire material possessions, right, out on the lawn. So you can compare an urban family in Beijing with, you know, um, a suburban family in Minneapolis with a sub-Saharan family um, uh, uh, in uh, Ethiopia and just compare, you know, what that household has. One of the other projects they did was to actually compare what do people eat? You know, how much do you consume in a week? And so you can actually see, uh, it's too bad you can't, uh, this is a little bit, um, uh, but you actually see um, an American household in the center left where you see a lot of packaged foods, right? As opposed to, um, I can't remember, uh, I think it's a Peruvian Indian family to the right. Um, and you can see much less packaged, a lot more um, staple foods uh, that are just part of their uh, weekly consumption. And so I just thought this was a, a really important image to leave you because I want you to think about uh, what does it mean to consume as opposed to savor, right? Uh, these families um, are, you know, units, uh, social units, uh, in which, you know, uh, individual lives are organized around. Um, and that is one of the first social units that many of you uh, have may, may have been raised with. Um, and these are the units that determine how you consume and how you savor. And so uh, what I want you to do is to really think about how in this society we have really come to um, think of eating and medicating as two very separate practices. We kind of think of them as different worlds, right? So you take your medicine, you eat your food. There's no such thing as eating to, you know, becoming, uh, eating to become well, except in, in, until after you become ill, right? So if one has, you know, say a particular uh, cancer, or if you know someone who um, might have been struck by, you know, um, high blood pressure, uh, they've been told you have to change your diet, you have to take these pills, but you also have to change your diet. So we live in a moment in which there's intensive pharmaceutical intervention. There's not one part of your daily life that's not been shaped by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and prescription medicine tends to be the main solution. It can, it's really considered to be the main approach to chronic ailments. 
And so basically, food is very, very far apart from medicine. We have these two realms that are totally different categories. Um, the reason why I want to talk about China is that, you know, in China as well as across Asia, there's a way in which food is understood to have medicinal qualities, right? Energetic qualities, but, you know, medicinal qualities. And as I mentioned before, medicine is actively consumed. So, you know, rethinking these categories of food and medicine might help us to see how different cultures, uh, through political institutions or through other forms, might have an interest in keeping these uh, categories very, very distinct. Um, and so, you know, earlier I talked about, you know, fearful consumption, right, and how there's concern about, you know, safe foods, uh, safe medicines. Uh, these meetings of consumer safety really reflect critical categories of nature and culture and power. Um, and anthropology, uh, what we try to do is we really try to cons consider these questions of purity um, or danger and how these uh, really uh, create the categories of belonging or exception. Um, and, you know, we're well into the 21st century. Uh, you know, 21st century China is, uh, as you can see, is a complex uh, nation. It is a nation full of um, very different uh, citizens who all are, uh, you know, confronting new technologies and new uh, notions of a different future. Uh, there's, uh, it's not to say that uh, consumers in China aren't concerned about food safety themselves. Uh, they are very, very concerned, uh, and you know, many of them are now starting to, uh, there's a green label uh, that the government has put out, uh, organic uh, label. Uh, a lot of celebrities, uh, uh, you know, uh, music and, uh, and uh, film stars that have started to promote their own brands. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you believe in Jackie Chan, then you, know, you should consume the, the foods that he's consuming because you know, it's considered to be safe. So issues of trust are going to continue to be uh, an ongoing issue. Um, uh, people pay very close attention to provenance. Where does uh, food or medicine come from? They're reading labels. You know? So in China, just like here, people are starting to read labels. You know, think about it. We are a nation that reads the labels. So how many of you, uh, when you eat something, are actually reading the label or before you buy something? Right? We are a nation of label readers. And we, uh, what's happening now in parts of Asia and China, too, is that there's um, the concern about how to, you know, how to consume and how to make sure that uh, you not only consume, but savor it. So, uh, I'll explain the last slide in a minute, but I, I just want to say that, you know, we're in a moment where there's a lot of ambivalence, okay? We're faced with neoliberalism that, you know, is telling us, you know, consume, consume, consume. This is how to be a good citizen. This is how you keep the economy going. Um, at the same time, we also face incredible disaster and incredible crisis. Right? It's an incredible moment where um, you know, we have to envision alternate futures because uh, the knowledge that we have been raised with are, is showing us that you know, conventional knowledge is, can only take us so far. And what we have to do is really go beyond that. We have to think about uh, what else is possible. So earlier, I talked about uh, you know, food and medicine and biotechnology, mostly as material substances. But I do want to talk a little bit about the symbolic. Um, and I want to talk about the invisible, the intangible. Um, I really believe that uh, the work of ethnography, uh, what we do in anthropology is to do research about people and culture, is that this work is also about the invisible and the intangible. It's about what holds us together as people, uh, what holds uh, close, as close to things and each other. And so if we can pay attention to collective meaning, uh, how meaning gets made, uh, that we might be able to go beyond the surfaces of capitalism and to really think about you know, what's beyond, what's beneath the surface of neoliberalism. So our job is really not simply to be historians um, of the past, but it's really to think about uh, you know, how we can really be historians of the present. You know, how has the present how, is it, how, how did it come to be? How is it possible that you're sitting here, um, you know, you're making yourselves actively for your future, right? Uh, but that future can take many, many different pathways. There are lots of different possibilities out there. And the same thing is true for the choices you're making concerning your food, your medicine, um, you know, your ways of life. So, you know, rather than thinking about radically new experiences um, that are shaped by materiality, um, what I'm going to argue is that, uh, in the end, you know, these age-old notions of health, wealth, 
and prosperity, or health, wealth, and success, uh, that these were still very, very prominent and very important in, in our lives. And so, uh, you know, I just want to end with this notion of paying attention. You know, pay very close attention to the pragmatic practices that shape your everyday life, because this is really how you can learn to live and eat well. So um, I'm going to end with this slide, and I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, why this slide in particular. And this is a funny story. This is uh, related to uh, 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 two years ago, uh, in 2009, the American Anthropology Association, uh, in shorthand, uh, is called the AAA. And you can imagine when I was in graduate school, you know, all these people say, yeah, I'm going to the AAA, and I'm thinking, why are you going to an insurance conference? What, what? <laughs> is there something I don't know? Um, but basically, every year, anthropologists get together, and it's pretty amazing, you know, so, you know, they usually meet in either D.C. or San Francisco or Chicago, and occasionally, it's in places like New Orleans. So, when it was in New Orleans, I said, oh my gosh, I have to go, this is great, I'm going to go, and, you know, uh, it was kind of like a party plane, because I ordered a plane in San Francisco, it went here to Los Angeles, then all the Southern California anthropologists got on the plane, and we're all flying to New Orleans, right? And so the same thing happened when we came back. Uh, there were all these anthropologists from New Orleans uh, coming uh, back to California. And we're all sitting at the baggage, we were standing at the baggage claim. And what do you think anthropologists do? What do you think they do for small talk? Well, you know, this, I'll give you my rendition. Uh, you know, rather than talking about, you know, what, you know, say, an uh, exotic tribe in Borneo might be eating or talking, uh, this one uh, colleague who, uh, he for many years uh, worked at HP as an industrial anthropologist, so he walked up to my colleague and he said, um, I heard you gave this amazing speech where you recited a haiku uh, in honor of Marilyn Strathern, who's a uh, well-known anthropologist in England. And he said, could you repeat that haiku? And so uh, he said, well, it's not really a haiku. It's you know, taken from this uh, Northern California poet, Jane Hirschfield, uh, who actually, um, uh, you know, like, so he kind of improvised. And you know, what he said was, you know, the world is changing, and life moves fast, pay attention. Uh, this is the actual quote. This is the, you know, he just kind of improvised. Um, but I really want to really uh, end with this notion of pay attention, that, you know, what we do as anthropologists is really, it's not just about documenting, but it's not just about taking good pictures or taking good stories. It's really about listening, and about listening well. And what you can do with regard to your own lives, and in terms of thinking about food and medicine, is to really pay attention. Pay attention to not just what's happening in your world, but pay attention to how your world is really interconnected uh, with other people's worlds, and how this uh, huge global notion of you know, uh, uh, global capitalism and global cultures, it, we're, it's still a very, very small world. And so when you pay attention, that's incredibly powerful. And I think that when you pay attention to your food and medicine, um, I think that's ultimately how we're going to uh, think ourselves out of you know, uh, the crisis that we're in at the moment. So anyway, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I know it's a long time to sit without you know, asking questions, but um, I do want to uh, open it up to Q&A. So thank you again for 